Welcome again, and uh, thank you for taking the time to join us. Today we will have uh, uh, the study, but next week we will uh, take, a, take time off and we'll resume after the Holy Week, as we call it. Uh, let's uh, get into the study itself. It's going to be uh, the continuation of the story of the church. So we will request Praveen to lead us in the prayer and then we will launch into the study. Let's pray. Father, we are in your presence, Lord. Thank you so very much for uh, giving us an opportunity to come together and study the history of the church, O oh God. Lord, as we study, we ask you to strengthen our faith especially we are going to study about Nicene Creed, which is uh, about the fundamental faith that our, uh, where our Christian relationship is based on. I pray you open our hearts and minds and we may be able to see the depths of uh, the doctrine through which, Lord, we may be able to understand you well and uh, ultimately we may be able to relate to well and have a good relationship with you, God. Let your spirit be upon Pastor Dan as he is teaching us. We want to hear your voice through him, Lord. The hour we spend in study and discussions may be uh, profitable to us and bring glory to your name. Thank you very much for listening to us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen and thank you, Praveen. And welcome to all of you again. Uh, I think uh, Vincent has joined us and Vanessa. Om Prakash, thank you all for joining us. Well, we are uh, today going to be moving into the second uh, uh, council of the church. Notice I said second council of the church. Anybody wants to tell me why I call it the second council? <laughs> Jerusalem council. Yes, the Jerusalem council. If you remember Acts chapter 15, we already did a little study on that. That was the first church council. Uh, and so that set the stage for these future councils. But of course, it was taking place after 300 years. Can you imagine that uh, we are now in church history, moving into the fourth century, 300 years after Christ and the apostles uh, and uh, it's amazing how time has gone by and how the development of Christian thought, Christian theology, the Christian church, you know, uh, began to slowly unfold as time went on. Sometimes I keep asking myself, you know, why does God take so much of time? I wish these things can be done quicker, but then, you know, God in his wisdom knows best. So we just learn from how God has ordained it. Okay, so what we'll do is, I am going to deal with basically the history. That is what, uh, you know, uh, uh, the, the whole purpose is of these sessions. Uh, it's mostly history and, uh, of course, a little bit of theology. Uh, so I won't go into a very in-depth study of the creed. Uh, but we can always do that. And if you have any you know, particular points from the creed to discuss, we can do that. So I just want to deal more, mostly with the history, but uh, to a lesser extent, the theology. Now, if you just give me a moment, I will just bring up the uh, slides on the screen and uh, we can then carry on from here. Okay, Praveen, can you see the screen? Yes. Yeah, okay. All right. So if you notice Council of Nicaea, and let's, uh, what led up to the Council of Nicaea? So uh, uh, if, if, you know, we need to understand that in these many years after the church was founded, the influence of Greek philosophy on Christian thought began to make its mark. You know, Greek philosophy taught that there were many gods. If you remember, you know, the various gods, uh, Apollo and, uh, uh, you know, Hercules, and there are so many gods in, in the Greek, the Greek pantheon. But the Greeks also believed, 
or rather I should say it slowly developed, the Greek philosophy also developed to believe in one perfect deity who they said was unchangeable and could have nothing to do with a flawed humanity or anything to do with the world of matter. They believe that matter keeps changing, uh, but God is perfect. This one supreme God, which they believed in, and then lesser gods, uh, this perfect God does not change. Why? Because perfection cannot change. And so this was basically the Greek philosophical thought that was constantly being discussed and debated. And it began to have an impact on Christian, Christian thought also. And here we enter these uh, two individuals, Arius and Alexander. Okay. If you remember, Arius was one of the bishops uh, in, that, in those times uh, in the eastern part of the Roman Empire. And so Arius basically said that the word, the living word we refer to as Jesus Christ is a created being. He belongs to the created order. But Alexander, who was also a bishop, I forgot to write, you know, what, uh, uh, which part of the Greek, uh, I mean to say the Roman Empire, but Alexander was also a bishop. Uh, and he disagreed with Arius. Uh, he placed all of creation on one side and the father and the eternal word on the other, right? So Alexander had a contention with Arius. The Arian motto, or which now we can call as Arianism, the motto of the Arians regarding the Logos, that is Christ, was that there was a time when he was not. There was when he was not. In other words, Arius tried to teach that at one time, the Logos, that is the word or the son of God did not exist and he was had to be created. But Alexander, uh, the other bishop taught that the word existed eternally with the father. There was no beginning to the word that is Christ, uh, that we refer to as Christ. Now what happens? Here comes Emperor Constantine. And uh, if you remember, I mean, uh, once again, I'm not going, you know, too, too much in depth with the history of the Roman Empire, but Emperor Constantine now became the emperor for uh, the Roman Empire, and he wanted to unite the West and the East. He had just finished a war to unite a divided empire, and he did not want any religious debates to divide the people again. Now, I must mention that Emperor Constantine was the first emperor who had a affinity for the Christian faith. Uh, we are not sure exactly how sincere he was, but there is definitely a change in the, in the Roman Empire. Emperor Constantine began to embrace the Christian way of life. And so he was not very happy to see these debates taking place theologically in the Christian world. So what he did was he ordered all the Christian bishops to meet together to decide the issue with regards to what uh, Arius and Alexander were debating. So what did he do? He invited all the bishops and leaders to Nicaea, a, 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 a town which was closer to where he was, all right? And he basically convened the Council of Nicaea. Now, about 300 bishops came, but notice one thing, very important almost all from the Eastern Empire, all right? You remember that is uh, the, the, the Roman Empire had the East, the, the East part and the West part. The West part was more with Rome and uh, uh, you know uh, where Rome was and uh, the East 
part was where Constantinople was. Uh, in fact, the number of bishops that came from Rome was very, very few. In fact, the Bishop of Rome himself did not come, but he sent somebody to represent him. Now I'll bring back this thought a little later because this is an important thing that we need to keep in mind. What, what we must understand is most of the bishops from the Latin speaking West had only a secondary interest in the debate. This is interesting, right? Uh, it was not Rome that initiated this uh, debate on uh, the, uh, the status of Jesus Christ, all right? The status of the word at that time, right? Um, so uh, the debate took place in Nicaea, 325 AD, as uh, is, uh, you know, as, uh, as we all know. And most prominent at the council was <clears throat> Pardon me, Alexander of Alexandria. There he is. He is the Bishop of Alexandria. Uh, Eusebius, who sided with Arius. Eusebius, who was the chief spokesman for the Arian position. Now, interestingly enough, among the attendees was a young deacon whose name was Athanasius. He was also from Alexandria. And he was not allowed to participate in the discussion because he was not yet a bishop. But he did play a central role, uh, especially later in articulating the Trinitarian confession of the church, which we will come to a little later, uh, you know, after this. So what happened at uh, the Council of Nicaea? They discussed the Arian position and Alexander's position helped by Athanasius. Eventually, the decision was made. Uh, all the bishops except two sign the creedal statement, all right? So the creedal statement was signed. This is the actual creed that they had developed. But the two who did not sign were Ari obviously Arius and, you know, uh, and, uh, uh, Eusebius. And the creedal statement basically uh, said that the ancient faith of the apostolic church uh, was the accurate reflection of the truth of God's nature to which the New Testament points. So, in other words, this is how they coined I'm once again, I'm just giving you a portion of it. We will read the whole statement later. With regards to Jesus Christ, this was what was said, that Jesus Christ was God of God, light of light, true God of true God, begotten, not made of one substance with the Father. So they decided there that Jesus Christ was not a created being but of the same essence or the same substance of the father. In other words, he always existed with the father. Now, interestingly enough, the council of Nicaea uh, did not discuss much about the Holy Spirit. Um, this came later on, but the discussion of the Holy Spirit actually began, you know, a long back, which we will come to in a while. But the main discussion of Council of Nicaea was the position or the status of Jesus, right? So uh, the two bishops who opposed this statement to believe that Jesus was not created were deposed and exiled. And Arius, this is the official position of the church at that time, uh, you know, uh, supported by Emperor Constantine. Arius and his writings were also anathematized, and he was exiled, uh, rather deposed as a bishop and exiled to, uh, uh, you know, another part of the empire. Unfortunately, the, uh, uh, the, the controversy did not stop. Uh, the controversy continued about the, the two positions. Until the Council of Constantinople in 381, uh, 
that is where the Nicene Creed was actually expanded and ratified once and for all. Okay, so I mentioned the Council of Constantinople. So let's quickly go there now, all right? What were the issues leading to the Council, Council of Constantinople? Uh, Emperor Constantine, who agreed to the position of Alexander of Alexandria and uh, banned or uh, deposed Bishop uh, Arius, changed his opinion. Emperor, the emperor himself changed his opinion because he was constantly being influenced by people who, who held this position against the fact that Jesus was uh, created. And what he did was for the next few years, there was constant tussle. He reinstated some of the deposed bishops. Some of the other bishops were actually, uh, you know, th those who took the position that Jesus was not created were, were deposed. So there was this tussle going on and the struggle lasted for 50 years. Uh, until Theodo Theodosius uh, became the emperor. Constantine died, and after him, I think three of his sons ruled the empire. Among them, there were a constant uh, conflict with regards to this. And so this went on until Theodosius became the emperor. And then he called for a council uh, in 381 AD. Right, And what happened in this council? In this council, again, Athanasius was very much present. And I think he was then now, now the bishop uh, of Alexandria. And uh, he argued very much for the divinity of Jesus. And hence, Jesus being fully divine, eternal, not created, was agreed upon. They accepted the divinity and they also accepted the divinity of the Holy Spirit. Now, I mentioned this because here in the Council of Constantinople, the Holy Spirit was discussed much more than it was in the Council of Nicaea. Uh, by the end of the fourth century, actually, now this is you know moving towards 480, uh, under the leadership of Saint Basil of Caesarea, Saint Gregory of, uh, of uh, Nyssa, and Saint Gregory of Nazianzus. These are called the Cappadocian Fathers. Once again, for your academic interest, just <laughs> I just mentioned these uh, uh, you know, names. They are, they are important in church history. They are called the Cappadocian Fathers. The doctrine of the Trinity took substantial form and it has maintained the same until today, right? Now, you might wonder, was the Trinity only discussed at this time? No, not necessarily. If you go back, you know, to 280, 200 years before, there was a person called Tertullian, with, which I think we mentioned earlier, uh, Tertullian initiated the use of the Latin word Trinitas. He was supposedly the first person to have used Trinitas. There is a debate on that. Uh, somebody else uh, was also mentioned. Uh, and he had brought the concept of the biblical teaching that the Father, Son, and Spirit are one in divine essence, but distinguished in relationship as persons within the inner life of God himself. I mention this because you must not think that it's only in the Council of Constantinople that the Holy Spirit was mentioned. Certainly not. The church had discussed this even back into, at 280. And of course, if you go back to, the, to Jesus Christ, he himself talks about the Holy Spirit, all right? So uh, the discussion was ongoing. But here in the Council of Constantinople, the divinity of the Holy Spirit was fully accepted. The result, of course, was, what was the result of the Council of Constantinople? It was called the Niceno-Constantinopolitan Creed, or uh, 
to make it easier to pronounce the shorter word nicene creed was what it was called or you know came to be known as more popularly right so it is based on the creed of nicaea but expanded uh, and so all of these things were very clearly uh, accepted all right today of course the nicene creed is accepted by almost all protestant catholic and eastern eastern orthodox churches and it offers a basis for unity all right so this is the council of nicaea and constantinople that completely then decided the christology that is who jesus is that he is fully divine he is not created he eternally coexisted with the father and of course the holy spirit and so the whole trinitarian perspective was formalized remember the discussion started back with jesus but the church formalized this as the doctrine of the church accepted by almost all of christianity except for the off offshoots now i want to mention something which i took out of our uh, website uh, there are some there are some misunderstandings about the council of nicaea or constantinople and the and the and the role of the roman catholic church many times and i think even we in our pre uh, uh, in our uh, you know pre reformation days used to think that it is the roman catholic church that brought this so called trinitarian doctrine into the christian uh, faith and which is not correct at all let me show you let me do a, 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 a give you a tabular form which gives you if you can see that the nicene myths uh, i'm sorry let me just go back there there it is the nicene myths and that what is the actual truth if you notice on your left on the screen uh, this is a myth the roman catholic church called the nicene council to enforce trinitarian teaching this is not correct the truth is rome did not call the council and was poorly represented if you remember i mentioned to you even the bishop of rome did not come to nicaea to uh, discuss this particular controversy and uh, in the in the box on the right among under truth the council did not have a complete doctrine of the trinity and gave scant mention of the holy spirit once again council of nicaea in 325 ad did not have much mention of the holy spirit so to to think and to believe that the roman catholic church is responsible for teaching as we would say a pagan doctrine called the trinitarian doctrine uh, is once again false and i think it is necessary for us to correct our understanding of history because like i said in our pre reformation days we used to blame the roman catholic church for everything and i i and i and i think uh, we were not representing history correctly let's go to the second box on your screen and the second box on the left constantine forced the council to accept a pagan doctrine this is emperor constantine this is also a myth emperor constantine did not uh, you know force the council to accept so called a pagan doctrine it was arius if you see on your right arius idea of god was shaped by ideas of pagan philosophers it the pagan philosophy came from arius not from constantine and the second point constantine forced all christians to accept the nicene creed which is a myth the truth is constantine cared more about uniformity than doctrine and he soon supported the arians and tried to enforce arianism so constantine flip flopped you know he accepted what uh, alexander and athanasius uh, presented but he again went back to arianism and uh, i'm presuming he even died believing in arianism it was much later on that this was corrected by emperor theodosius i wanted to bring this up because 
for us, in especially from the WCG, uh, we probably have had or rather misrepresented church history to think that the Roman Catholic Church is responsible for uh, you know, the Trinitarian doctrine. They were not even interested. It was the Eastern Church and all the Eastern bishops who actually brought the Trinitarian doctrine into, uh, you know, into acceptance of the Christian faith. Okay, having mentioned these, uh, this basic history, let's do a little bit of theology once again. I'm not going to go uh, very much in depth, uh, but I want to ask this question, is Jesus really God? Because that was the main controversy uh, with regards to this uh, uh, Arianism and what the others presented and the Nicene Creed. Let me just go back and uh, refresh your memory with regards to the Greek influence on Christianity and something called monarchianism. You know, some Christians began to speculate that the supreme God, God Almighty, created angels. Of course, that is biblical, right? The angels belong to the created order. And uh, we believe that God Almighty created angels. And these angels, uh, the, the unfortunate thing is, the, some of them started to believe that these angels were the ones who created the physical world. Right? In other words, they believed angels were intermediaries between physical humans and God. All right. So this is the Greek influence on Christianity because Greek thought was there are many gods, but there is one supreme God. And, uh, you know, and uh, this, what do you call it? The, uh, the smaller gods. Uh, are the ones who created uh, the physical world, all right? And if you remember, if you remember our discussion on Gnosticism, uh, I think uh, the Gnostic thought also had something similar. And uh, Gnostic thought was a co compilation of many, many thoughts, but it certainly had uh, a Greek influence there. Now, what is the problem here? Okay, uh, let me see. Of course, I, I mentioned Arius and Alexander. Uh, now, what happened was, by believing that God created angels and angels created the world, they started, some of them, like Arius, took this and imposed it on Jesus by saying, Jesus was one of the angels created or the first angel created by God, and Jesus became the intermediary between humans and God, and hence Christ or Jesus was only an angel, right? Uh, and not, rather, he had a beginning. Now, if you remember, I mentioned this word monarchianism. Mon monarchianism was a teaching that existed even much before the Council of Nicaea. What did they teach? That Jesus is only a man in whom dwelled the power of the supreme God. In other words, Jesus was not God. Only the power of the supreme God resided in him. Now, there was another branch of monarchianism that taught that God is actually uh, exists in three modes. And this is how the concept of modalism began to uh, invade Christian theology, right? God existed as father, son, spirit. In other words, they are not distinct, but the same person. He appears as father at one time. Then he puts on the mask of the son. And then he puts on another mask of the spirit all at, the, you know, uh, uh, at different times. This is what is called modalism. Once again, these are the teachings that existed from Greek influence and from monarchianism. And that is how they began to think that Jesus was only an angel 
who had the power of God and hence was thought to be God, but was not God. And like I said earlier, one of the people who was affected by this philosopher was Arius, uh, who was uh, uh, an elder in the Egyptian city of Alexandria. What did Arius teach? Once again, just recapping a bit. He taught that there was one creator who created the Logos, all right? The word or the wisdom of God. The Logos can also be called the word or the wisdom of God. And this Logos in turn created everything else. And they believe, and Arius began to teach that it is this Logos who became Jesus Christ. And uh, if I'm not mistaken, this is also what the Jehovah Witnesses teach. In fact, they have changed the translation. I mean, they have their own translation of the Bible. They have changed John 1.1 1, 1 <laughs> to make it appear that the Logos was created by uh, God. And he was not God, but he was only a God. All right, or considered to be a God. I think this is how Jehovah's probably, uh, you know, have their theology with regards to Jesus. Now, uh, but uh, like I mentioned, Alexander debated that. They upheld the divinity of the son uh, and said, uh, Jesus' divinity was not bestowed but was inherent. And those two words are very important. Jesus' divinity was not bestowed upon him, but it was inherent in him. In other words, he was eternally uh, divine, not a, bes uh, a bestowed divinity. Now, uh, okay. So Alexander and, the, and his assistant Athanasius countered the notion that God was once without the word and God, and they said that God cannot be without the word and that the word is therefore without beginning and eternally generated by the father. Once again, these are all theological terms, basically meaning Jesus Christ did not have a beginning. He was always present with the father and he was eternally, uh, you, we use the word begotten, or some uh, theologians use the word generated, uh, which does not mean that he had a beginning, but he was always with God. Now, I want to bring you to uh, two words here. Uh, the words used uh, in the creed with regards to uh, Jesus of, is of the same essence of the father, which means he is divine you will be introduced to these two words. Uh, homo usias. Homo, this is a Greek term. Homo usias, which means of the same essence. But interestingly, there is another word in the Greek language with a different spelling. It is also homo usias, but it brings a I into it, if you notice on your screen, which means or changes the meaning of similar essence, right? Um, same essence and similar essence are completely different, all right? Alex, uh, rather, Arius taught that Jesus was of similar essence, but Athanasius and Alexander taught that homo osias, Jesus was of the same essence. Once again, just to bring you up to speed with regards to some theology that was discussed uh, during the creed. Right? Uh, okay, so what is, uh, what is the big deal about this? See, if you take the second point, of similar, similar essence, it would mean that Jesus was almost divine. In other words, he was not divine, but almost divine. Did you see the difference? And these are the play of words that uh, unfortunately uh, brought in, you know, a, 
a false theology or a false doctrine into the Christian faith. All right. So Jesus cannot be almost divine. He is either divine or he's not divine. All right. From the English language, you cannot say he's almost divine. So this is, these are some of the uh, discussions that they had. And of course, like I said, uh, the orthodox theology was that Jesus is of the same essence, not of similar essence. So then we go down then to one more thought with regards to uh, the, the divinity of Jesus. Who can save us? Who can save human beings? Right? You see, the fundamental, uh, fundamental, I should say, to the validity of, the Christ, of Christianity is the reality of the redemption. I mean, we are all waiting for our redemption. So uh, this is made possible by Jesus Christ. And that is a doctrine that we all believe in. But who can save us? Can a created being save us? Or only can only God save us? Right? So the orthodox doctrine is that redemption is made possible only by the work of no being less than true God. And hence, the Lord Jesus Christ, who saves us, has to be God. He cannot be almost God. He cannot be, you know, a created being to, cre to save a created order. You see, Arius believed that a Christ designated as divine by virtue of his special creation could serve as a true redeemer and a mediator between God and humanity. But Athanasius and the others were relentless and unwavering uh, to hold fast to the truth that no being less than a true God could in fact reconcile humanity to Christianity. So in other words, our salvation is of God, not of a created being. And finally, only the one who has life inherent in him can impart life eternal, right? A created being has no life inherent. A created being is always dependent on the creator. And if Jesus, nice, Jesus Christ is created and he's not a creator, he has no life inherent in him and hence cannot be the savior of the world. So these were some of the discussions that ultimately brought the creed. And so in, uh, for just a few moments, let me just read the creed to you as it was finalized in uh, the Council of Constantinople. So I'll bring up the creed on the screen. It is in two parts because I couldn't fit it all in one screen. And I'll make just a few comments and then we can get into a discussion. So what is the creed that was finally uh, uh, formalized? It says, we believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, creator of heaven and earth and of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us men and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he, be, he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary, and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. Continuing, on the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. And if you notice, the Son and the Son is in inverted commas. I'll make a comment about that. 
with the father and the son he is worshiped and glorified he has spoken through the prophets we believe in one holy catholic and apostolic church we acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins we look for the resurrection of the dead and the life to, of the world to come amen that is the creed and if you will notice that it has all the essentials of the christian faith and that is the reason why any christian whether he is roman catholic eastern orthodox protestant methodist baptist all of them believe in this because it contains the basic fundamentals of the christian faith the i should say the essentials of the christian faith now i mentioned to you that the and the son in the middle of this uh, uh, you know this uh, this uh, one on the screen is in inverted commas this word words apparently was added later right well, it was not in the original greek text of the creed but they were added later in the latin in the latin this has been added why because the latin church which is the west which is rome believe that the uh, the holy spirit proceeds from the father and the son now for some reason the eastern orthodox church objected to this and they did not want this addition to be made uh and so they brought in their objection and if i can just mention this was one of the reasons why the eastern orthodox church split from the western roman catholic church when the split took place the west became the roman catholic church and the eastern orthodox church remained as uh, as as the same um so this was one of the reasons why um uh, you know the split took place which we will discuss uh, late much later on so this is basically uh, the council of nicaea and the council of constantinople and how the creed came into being uh, something that is accepted by all most most christians but once again there can be you know few here and there things which uh, which we can discuss so that's uh, where i will stop for today and uh, i hope it was not too heavy <laughs> i'm sure uh, discussing uh, this kind of theological you know perspectives can be a little on the heavier side but i hope i tried to make it as simple as uh, possible there are so much more detail you know and then just trying to just pick up the main things sometimes is a little difficult and you lose out on a few things so that is what i'd like to present today the floor is open for any comments questions uh, that you'd like to make at this time all right i haven't seen any hand go up yet uh but i just wanted for those of us who have been in the church for a long time uh i uh i brought out that tabular form where i try to help you understand that uh you know to blame the roman catholic church for the trinitarian doctrine is a completely false it is actually the eastern church who thought about it more than the rome roman church so um uh i hope you recognize eastern orthodox the roman catholic they're all you know the the split took place and of course from the roman catholic church came the protestant <laughs> reformation right so uh we used to think that the roman catholic church did that but that was not uh, true right and of course we used to blame emperor constantine and even that was not true because emperor constantine didn't didn't believe in the divinity of the sun he went back into arianism right any questions with regards to the my slide on uh is jesus really god 
any thoughts or comments you'd like to make? Uh, is there any uh, ambiguity there? I tried to bring out what the council decided that only a only God can save humanity and hence you cannot believe that God, I mean, Jesus is created because he is the redeemer of humanity. Any thoughts on that or you'd like to add something to that? There are some Christians uh, who believe that Jehovah Witnesses, I think even the Mormons uh, and uh, and of course, the splits from the WCG, uh, many of the splits, they still continue to hold that. Um, I don't know about the splits from the WCG, but uh, we used to, we used to believe, I'm not sure, Mr. Rao, maybe you can remember. Did we say Jesus was God? <laughs> right. Franklin, do you have any thoughts on that? <coughs> Go ahead, Mr. Rao. No, sir, we believe that Jesus is God. We also believe the Father is God. Yes. So we believe in two gods. <laughs> uh, that was the biggest problem for us. Still, it is confusion, sir, isn't it? How to understand two persons, one God? It is still, I think only in the kingdom, only we can. Uh, yeah, yeah, I, I understand what you're saying. I mean, we, it's very difficult for us to put it in words, but I am trying to, I am trying to show our confusion in the earlier days. We said Father is God, Jesus is God, so we believed in two gods, and uh, I don't know how we accepted that, and we condemned the tr Trinity, <laughs> while we continue to believe in two gods. Uh, Franklin, you have a thought. Sir, about the Holy Spirit, no, sir. I yeah. think we did not say, we did not teach correctly. Uh, I think we, 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 we taught that the Holy Spirit is only a force. Yes, but that is because we completely rejected the Trinity. We said it came from pagan origin. And hence, uh, because other religions had the Trinity, you know, even Hinduism has a Trinity. I think the Egyptians have a Trinity. Uh, probably the Greeks do. Um, and so we did not want to subscribe to that, but we remained with a confusion or, or a contradiction by saying the father is God and Jesus is God. And that is where I think we got bold <laughs> completely. Any other thoughts? Praveen, you want to add something to, I mean, from your uh, study of the Trinity, uh, the, the creeds especially? And of course, I know you've given a very good sermon on that, uh, where you discuss the whole creed, which I didn't want to go into that because that's solid theology. You want to add anything to me? I think much, Pastor. In fact, uh, today also I'm writing my paper on this, this particular topic. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yes, right. yes sir. A uh, good uh, couple of points, which I missed out and I could uh, include in my notes. <laughs> Very good. I'm glad it is helpful. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yes, Franklin, go ahead. Sir, uh, sir uh, would, can we say, sir, that, that, that there was a divine hand that led uh, to the uh, drawing of the creed? There is a divine hand in entire church history. <laughs> In all of church history, God is present. The Holy Spirit, you remember Jesus said, the Holy Spirit lead us into all truth. And that is a very significant statement Jesus made. In other words, Jesus said, what was Jesus saying? He was saying that you don't have all the truth now. But I will send you uh, uh, an advocate, uh, a comforter, who will lead you into all truth. So I believe the Holy Spirit has constantly been guiding the church. And being, bringing all of these uh, very important thoughts uh, to the Christian faith. And today, of course, we have, uh, you know, we are blessed by that. Uh, the Holy Spirit leading our own fellowship into a reformation. Since um, uh, Mr. Rao also mentioned it, how, how can we understand uh, the Bible? 
how three and one maybe i would like to share a few points um, uh, what we are already uh, studying uh, there are two words we need to consider number one is uh, ushias which pastor already mentioned which uh, the translation is essence okay or we can take the word we can use it for it uh, other word we can use for it is being the word being is ushias Number two word is um, hypostasis. You might have heard this is also a Greek word. Hypostasis, which means person. Uh, in Latin, it is called prosopon. Okay. In Greek, they use the word um, hypostasis. When we talk about the doctrine of Trinity, we believe that there is uh, three hypostasis. One, usias, which is homo usias. We are using homo means one or same not similar one or same one being three persons that is the belief about doctrine of trinity in if you boil it down in simple words so now coming to the explanation we need to have proper definitions for these two words what is a person and what is a being most of the times especially we all are in, uh, influenced by the Western thought, we can say, or we can say with Western philosophy, if you go back to the early church, we all of our understanding has been influenced by the Greek philosophy when it comes to definitions of various things. According to the Greek, Greek philosophy and Western thought, when you talk about a person, what comes into their mind is what a person possesses. If you call about, if you talk about somebody, well, he, the person, they either they talk about his character, whether he's a good man, bad man, evil man, or whatever the things are, what kind of habits he has, and uh, whether what kind of rich, uh, I mean, property he has, what did he study? Even now, when we talk about people, most of the times we bring these aspects to define somebody, uh, somebody's person, person. Like, you know, again, the word personality is different. The word personality means the character a person uh, has. Okay. So, in the West, we always define a person with uh, the kind of things he possesses or he does or he has. But in Indian culture and Eastern culture, especially the Jewish culture also, the person means a per, uh, we all know like you know if you go to some village and all they ask your name right after your name what do the what do they ask who are you belong to the word person is related to the relationships we have a person is a person because of another person that is why in the east we always ask the question who who are you the word who, the question who always speaks about relationships. Who are you related to? That's what it indicates. In the West, it's always about what? What do you have? What have you possess? So in the East, it is not that it, it, it is not that way. So that is one of the reasons. See, if you read a gene old testament, old testament and new testament, also, there is a huge genealogy. And no others have that similar, such kind of things in the West. So the, the Jewish people are very much concerned about their genealogy because it is so very important for them to relate to somebody, to relate to their family. So the word person is always related to another person. Having said that, coming to the uh, Trinity. When, who do you call a father? The father is a father of son. Father cannot be father without the son. Son cannot be son without the father. Right? And a father and son, uh, so that is how father is father because of the son. Son is son because of the father. They are father and son because of the Holy Spirit. So, if you remove any one person from this, remove the son, can the father exist? Father cannot exist. If you remove the father, son cannot exist. If you remove the Holy Spirit, father and son both cannot exist. So, a person, if you even want one single person, a, a, single, a person can be a person without an or with another person. So, when we talk about Trinity, father, son and the Holy Spirit, they cannot be separated. 
in the western mind we always think individually the individual persons but uh, according to the very definition of the word person they cannot be separated there should be more than one person so father son and holy spirit these are three persons they cannot be separated and they have to they are one because of their relationships if you remove this relationship they cannot exist again if you remove fatherhood from father son cannot exist if you re remove sonhood from son father cannot exist so they are inseparably one and they are distinct if there is no distinction there cannot be union okay if there is no distinction there is no point in calling father son and all so a distinction only brings union so with this uh, that is what we are calling the bringing the union thing the being thing that's what we call being god is one being as father son and the holy spirit as father son and the holy spirit in their relationships that is being one three distinct persons i know it is a little difficult for us to believe and one good thing i would like to tell is uh, 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 we need the grace of god uh, to believe or believe these by the spirit of god we can and we don't need to understand all these also even if we don't understand god is not going to kick us out of his kingdom he is going to appreciate us even more uh, to have to put our faith in him so uh, understanding it is going to add richness to our experience and our relationship with god so we all need to ask god to help us out like the father of uh, demon possessed son asked lord i believe help my unbelief let it be our prayer continuously yes i think uh, those are some important points if i uh, yes yeah, sorry murthy go ahead <clears throat> the fundamental tenet of the old testament is shema hero israel the lord your god is one so that runs through the entire old testament how are we going to reconcile that reconcile it with our new testament understanding okay uh, i think the yeah pravin you had a thought on that yeah even in the new testament when we are talking about trinity uh, trinity the you when we talk about unity of god and oneness of god the basis is completely taken from the hebrew shema even in the new testament we are taking the word shema one when we talk about one the the i guess it is kapadu one of the kapadushian fathers who said you know the moment i talk about one i i will be reminded about three the moment i talk about three i will be reminded about the one you know you cannot have one without three you cannot have three without one what i mean by that is it just it may sound a repetition of what i said before god is called eternal father how can he be a father without eternal son the one is about is not about individuals the one is actually because of the relationship that is where it is based so uh, the basis for oneness which trinitarian theology teaches is is the shema itself even jewish the, the word jewish word in shema the hero israel the lord your god is one the one is not monad monotheistic which we call mona means single person he is not single he is not alone he is one means like you know we all came together and said we are one yeah there is a plurality in singularity and there is a singularity in plurality one good example i can bring is that is the creation of humans there is no better analogy than talking about creation of humans when we talk about singularity and plurality when god created it is it is written in the scripture where god said let us make man in our own image according to our own likeness and uh, scripture says he created them god created man and uh, and verse 27 it is written male and female he created them that is verse 27 and when we come to genesis chapter 2 we understand that god created man first and from man he brought eve out but actually when genesis chapter 1 when we read we clearly see that god says 
male and female he created where was eve when he uh, when he created uh, the humans eve was already inside adam that is the very reason god did not create eve out of mud again he brought her out of adam because eve was already inside adam having said that a man can we call somebody a man if there is no female in the world the gender male makes sense only when there is female the gender female makes sense only when there is male and you cannot separate them if you separate any of them remove any of them there cannot be any gender so this oneness is in such a way there is a plurality in this oneness if we remove any anything in from this the oneness cannot exist so if you remove men men from humanity female cannot be a female female if you remove female the female cannot be a male that is how the oneness is and that is the hebrew understanding of one that's why scripture says uh when when moses writes about adam and eve a man shall leave his father and mother and join to the, his wife and they shall become one flesh if you take physically when are we becoming one flesh we can never become one flesh it is the gender that is a unique and blessing that god had given us which reflects the nature of god where singularity and plurality brought together and that is the oneness we are talking about when we talk about uh, uh trinity uh sorry murthy this uh, this thing about the shama there is uh, uh some scholars have studied that even further and there is also another perspective to it which perhaps uh, we don't have time today but we will do it one of these days uh and i felt that it was a very interesting thought but if i can just mention we uh, we christians who when we talk about the trinity we must be very careful that we don't contradict ourselves like pravin was saying when we talk about the trinity we must say god is one being and three persons you should never say god is three person uh, uh, one person and three persons that is a contradiction right you cannot say god is one person and three persons no god is one being but three persons so that is that removes the contradiction <clears throat> so be careful that you don't contradict yourself if you should talk about the trinity to someone else okay any final thoughts i think we have basically finished our time today uh, otherwise i hope that uh, at least we give you some material for uh, expanding your mind a little bit more uh, and uh, we will continue our studies don't don't forget next week we are not having our bible study because uh, we are having team Uh, leadership meetings and we'll come back to you on the third week of uh, this month thank you so much for joining us let's close in prayer uh may i request one of you to close in prayer instead of me volunteering someone uh right can i vincent if you can uh, yeah okay i was just yeah but you go ahead vincent next time <laughs> Uh, Vincent could pray if he wants. Would you want Vincent to pray? Well, if uh, Vincent is willing, yes. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Almighty God, Father in heaven, thank you for this opportunity we must to be together to learn about the church history. Thank you for guiding. all of us through the holy spirit throughout the ages help us to remember whatever we have heard today guide us into all holiness and also pray for all your servants in different parts of the world especially here in india bless them protect them prosper the work they do and i pray for peace throughout the whole world almighty god especially in europe in ukraine and other parts of the world like in yemen in in uh, ethiopia and libya and syria and other parts of the world where there's a lot of friction a lot of unrest almighty god please guide the leaders of the world they will have the sense to 
work for their own people, work for the common people, work for peace and harmony, work for justice. Bless each one of us on Almighty God who are here and those who couldn't come to hear your holy words through your servants. Bless each one of us, help us have a good night's rest so that we wake up refreshed tomorrow. And I pray all these things in the name of our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 Thank you, Vincent. Thank you all for joining us.